changing in the next week also. But for the time being, we skip till tomorrow. We'll have an afternoon, both morning and afternoon. And we'll arrange uh, lunch, light lunch for everyone, right? Because the morning session, you have two lectures, there'll be tea, and then we have lunch, and then the afternoon. Can you hear me well? Okay. All right. So today uh, we are going to continue to uh, to learn more about the uh, complex oxide components. And then uh, today's work uh, is mostly synthesis, uh, how to grow uh, these complex materials, what the issue and uh, what is the most reasonable approach to uh, get the highest quality of thinking for, for uh, study fundamental science and as well as the uh, device applications. Okay, so the, this one has uh, two lectures. And the first one is more general, but I'd like to introduce um, very versatile techniques, and uh, uh, among the many, many techniques, I think probably this is the most uh, easily adaptable in any labs, and then can get the highest quality of inputs, and that's what I'm going to do. So critical issues in digital synthesis is um, many of those, but I think one of the most important aspects is critical issues of stoichiometric control. So as I said, that is a uh, dental lens, we have like a multi-component systems. And then for example, strontium <coughs> titanate, strontium and titanium, and, and those are two cations, and plus some oxygen. But at the same time, you have some other materials like uh, um, yttrium carbon oxide, which has uh, how many different compounds elements, so yttrium, Barium and copper, you have three elements. And cation and oxygen is seven. We call seven minus delta, which means oxygen can, the chemistry can be varied too. So it's a very important to really make a strategic control. How good the control is, is another issue. And then what level of the strategic you want. And another important fact is crystalline quality of materials. Is we are actually talking about epitaxial dentulums and as good as the bulk single crystals, and whether the material you grow is that level of the quality or perfection of the materials. And then other, like impurities and other issues, but your dislocations and point defects and all these defects are very important aspect. So those two you have to address. But there's uh, so many different possibility of growing thin films. <coughs> and among those, I'd like to introduce just a few, but I'd like to emphasize the one of technique today, which is very easily adaptable in any labs. And then uh, it's very powerful technique. And then that's what I'm going to discuss. So you have a two, like a pathway of making <coughs> complex thin films. And the first method is using multiple elemental source. For example, you have a strontium titanate. And then for example, this is the example of oxide MBE. I got it from uh, my friend, the Dow Shulam and Cornell. And the technique actually allows individual elemental flux control. So for example, you have a strontium or titanium, you have two different elements, and you have an independent source, independent temperature, and then your flux is stoichiometric to flux. You have exactly one and one, one to one ratio of flux and provide exactly stoichiometry of thin films on wafer. But this elemental source of technique here, an individual flux control, because of the, you have individual flux and you have to control it precisely, and the system get bigger, 
and then more expensive. And then it's not just actual source temp source cost important, and actually a lot of its cost involved is a very precise control. And that's why and then only a few groups, I mean it's it's not I mean it's a very more popular, getting more popular. But I think initially this is a this very long learning curve and doing this. For example, is when you adapt adapt to this kind of technique, it's, it's growing really high quality materials. It takes longer to, to learn because you have individual like flux control has to be very, very accurate. And an alternative technique, I mean the other problem of this elemental uh, technique, I mean there's a lot of advantages as well. But one of the other difficult part of the, this problem is, is uh, individual elemental control. Is you have to oxidize these elements. So what we provide is pure element like a strontium metal and titanium metal, and you have to oxidize using another oxygen source from the chamber. So you have a different oxygen source you can think about. Every pretty much you know the. The most popular and imagine, imaginable source is oxygen gas, which is molecular oxygen. But however, the molecular oxygen is a O2. It's already bonded very strongly, but you have to actually have an elemental oxygen incorporated in the system, and then it's, it's not very reactive, and then it needs a lot of oxygen to make a stable phase. So, in order to overcome this problem, this oxygen B, they use the very, very active oxygen. It's uh, like a high activity oxygen. There's uh, two different types of oxygen they use. One is atomic oxygen. So atomic oxygen can be generated by molecular oxygen. And molecular oxygen can be actually activated by oxygen plasma source, which means you provide some type of the uh, oxygen, the RF, RF plasma, and then you create a small fraction of the oxygen, atomic oxygen. But not only 100% atomic oxygen, but the atomic oxygen is O, not O2. Okay? The oxygen, atomic oxygen is a single O, it's a lot more active than molecular oxygen. But it's, the problem with atomic oxygen is percentage of atomic oxygen, not 100%. You are breaking this molecule, it coming to only a small fraction of atomic oxygen. Another problem with this atomic oxygen is this atomic oxygen is easily recombined and forming the molecular oxygen. So whenever you touch this atomic oxygen, the metal surface, it immediately will become molecular oxygen. So if you have to avoid like uh, any any recombination. So that's why atomic oxygen source usually quartz tube, and which is a much more longer lifetime of atomic oxygen. But that is the one way you can overcome this activity issue. And another way people overcome this issue using ozone source, the O3. Okay, you know the ozone. And ozone is very reactive, but also very dangerous too. The way they actually generate an ozone generator, I think ozone can be generated easily by UV. And that's why you go high altitude, you get an ozone layer. And then, uh, but you can create ozones in the ozone source, and then you can purify ozone you have a pure ozone or like molecular oxygen and oxygen like percentage mixture one, but you want to use a highest concentrated ozone, actually they're much more effective to oxidizing the element. But, and that involves cost of the ozone source. You purify it in storage and dangerous, but it's, it's something is involves some kind of risk and high cost. But this oxygen MB has another advantage. You have individual atomic layer control. You have elemental layer control. For example, when you grow strontium titanate, when you grow it, I can put down strontium layer only, then titanium layer only. So I can make, like, a really not growing the unicell by unicell. It's like a really one half unicell, which means strontium oxide layer and titanium oxide layer, you can grow individual layer control. And that allows you to grow strontium titanate epitaxially on silicon, and we'll talk about that next week. And because it's when you grow this on strontium titanate 
as, as, as uh, the on silicon, and silicon immediately oxidizes it and forming SiO2 amorphous layer. So in order to overcome this, and they have to use a strontium layer first. If you go titanium go first, then titanium silicide forms, which means titanium silicide is not ideal. So you have to overcome. So what kind of element do you go touch first? And that's the way you have a more degree of freedom you can play. Uh, but at the same time, and then you have a lot of flexibility control, but involves the cost, involves a lot of learning curve, and then you need a lot of experience and then, and then uh, control of this, because it's a lot of human factors as well. And then another method is, as I said, is composite source, which is, is less controllable, looks like, but it's very easy to adapt and use it. What they mean is, for example, your strontium titanate and then ichimeran carboxide, or even six, seven, eight elements, you want to do this way. You have a, for example, you have a seven elemental compound source. You have seven, com seven elemental composite, like a compound of oxide material, for example. In that case, you need seven sources. You have to control seven of them individually, precisely stoichiometric, one, 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 one ratio, or two, two, three, five ratio, whatever ratio it is. And that means it's, it's nightmare to control those. Okay? So in order to do easy way to do, okay, that's simple. Just mix everything in the one target. And then you making this target just the way you weigh the actual cations you are going to add. Precisely weigh it and mix it and grind it, make a completely reactive composite. Okay? It's not really composite means of like individual cations, but it's completely reacted and same kind of phase, phase pure actually composite material. For example, you make a yttrium bearing carboxide target. It's not yttrium oxide, barium oxide, carboxide mixing it. It's a yttrium barium copper oxide, exactly one to three compound actus phase, exactly structure, same structure phase and then you make this bulk material. And this bulk material synthesis is any lab can do. You only have a, like a mortar, like grinding, you weighing machine, and then you have a bone meal, and you have a furnace, and press, that's it. And we have our lab, even though we have a thin film lab, and we have a dedicated actual powder labs to making our, all the targets. The reason is that the, the making your own target is commercially available targets limited? And you need to call and ask your commercial companies, okay, I want to make this particular new material I want to try. They never done it. They don't know how to make it. Or well, they can be very expensive. So easiest way to do is you have a lot of expertise of ceramic people. They can do better or they can be faster and then they can have a much more flexibility of control of this composition. So that is the flexibility is a lot of labs can do. And the reason I introduced this, and then you have a two extreme of thin film synthesis. One is you cost $2 million of equipment and with a very precise control of a certain type of experiment. But a lot of experiment, the exciting experiment can be done without doing this. And then very simple process and which you can do, as long as you understand the processing parameters, and you can do thin films as good, or sometimes even better than MBA grown films. Okay? The reason behind this, I'll explain it. Why this is more advantageous than the other one? Because it's composite target. When you mix this one, already reacted one, then you don't have to worry about oxidation of the source. Source is already oxidized, and source is stable. So then you can put no matter how much oxygen in the vacuum chamber, and then it doesn't matter. But however, when you do this kind of chamber, you cannot put a lot of oxygen in the chamber. As soon as we put a lot of oxygen, and you all the sources oxidize it. Okay? Once you oxidize the source, then you're forming the oxide layer on the top of this uh, metal, met, like a strontium metals or whatever metal, 
and your flux is very unstable because it's covered by oxide, then atomic flux cannot come out of this oxide layer. So you have a very narrow window you can bring oxygen in, which means sometimes you grow materials and came out in the chamber is very oxygen deficient. For example, you grow like a very tight chain of ion beam. And then crystalline quality is almost perfect, but electrically measurement is very leaky because a lot of oxygen vacancies, because when you grow this, then oxygen is not enough, and then it's very weak. And then it's a really what you need, high quality of ferroelectric properties, but leaky, you cannot really switch this one. Okay? So that's sometimes some applications, some experiments, some physics experiments, they benefit from this type of work. But a lot of other ones, you can use composite target process as I mentioned here, this, this approach is very easily adaptable and very useful those. And then there's two main methods applied and used in many groups. First one is pursed laser deposition, and which is already introduced yesterday and, then, and with a high pressure in situ read. But if those two techniques and they use the exactly same kind of reactive powder and reactive composite target and maybe size is a little different but exactly the same material and but it's actually generating flux generating this flux of like a strontium, titanium, whatever oxygen or ethereum, barium, carbon dioxide flux and you actually use either using photon or using this momentum transfer using argon ions the mechanical just momentum transfer. So you have two different simple ways to do, but those two are very versatile and easily adaptable. And then the, one of the disadvantages of personalized deposition in many groups are doing, and then you have an initial cost of this is a laser. Most of people use the excimal laser. Okay? Excimal laser, use, uh, most of people use a krypton fluoride krypton and fluorine, you mix it with neon and then buffer, buffer gas, and which is, is, is a one of the main costs of your system. And then, and then you have optics, you have a lot of optics involved, and also you have adjustment, this uh, actual lot of tweaking of the focal, focusing and then beam profiling, you have a lot of issues, and then because of this one involves very uniform energy density on top of the target to remove this uh, gas, uh, the, uh, the atomic flux. And you need to have a lot of fine tuning of this. So we have my group have both techniques, sputtering and POD. And we have uh, multiple chambers for POD, multiple chambers for the sputtering. But certain materials we use POD, certain materials sputtering. And there's some reason for that. And then for sputtering here is a lot of advantages. And then that's what I'm going to talk about. We have spent time, time and those two, what's the advantage, what's the important parameters, and you can do that. So here I'm going to ask you guys here, how many of you have done PLD in your lab? Okay, how many have done sputtering in your lab? Okay, these are all the oxide material, is that correct? Or just the different materials? Oxide, oxide. oxide materials, okay. So, I'm going to talk about the PLD, you have some experience, and then, and then sputtering is some experience. And then uh, when you actually deposit the thin films, and people report this uh, thin film characteristics, and the way it spends on like a certain section of paper, talk about how they grow, what the quality of this, how they characterize it, and we end up this structure, then we measure these properties, and we found this interesting phenomena, and what we believe was happening. And that's a simple way of story to actually talk about this uh, new materials you have to talk about. And then, uh, but the, when you actually make this material, when you read the papers, it's the immediately you can see quantity of thin films from the few sentences or one paragraph, you will know what the quality of material. And then that is very important because uh, you are actually the best quality material and giving best science. <laughs> and the material is not good enough, then whatever you measure is not real intrinsic practice, which means it's not really proving 
fundamental science was going on. Maybe some other extrinsic effect is embedded and then masked and then those intrinsic properties. So I think it's a very important to, to actually make materials and then high quality, but doesn't necessary to, you need a very expensive and high control system like the MB or anything like that, okay? So talk about here, so the technique is laser, the, uh, the PLD, and PLD system is, is a very simple. You have it here is a target material, okay? The target is composite target, and then size of composite target, as you know, mostly one inch diameter. And then you mount it here in the multiple target carousel. So you can have a one, two, three, four, five, many targets in single chamber. It's a very compact design. And chamber can be much smaller. And then your laser window bring the krypton fluoride 248 nanometer of exciting laser. That's the most popular and then and the laser we use. Well, some people use uh, the frequency doubling, tripling, and, uh, and the YAG laser, and then make an infrared laser to a UV laser, and then to make uh, energy density, the uh, wavelengths get smaller. And then, but I think you can use different sorts of laser can be used. Sometimes some people with argon fluoride laser, certain material system, but argon fluoride is a little bit dangerous because it generates a lot of ozones. And you have to be very careful in using high, low 196 of argon fluoride laser. So it's most people, and the use of krypton fluoride laser, which is a very popular one. And then you have the upper side, just simple the heater, and then but this chamber is very compact, small. But outside here, where the laser beam comes from, you have to bring the laser first. Then you have to make a beam profiling, very uniform region beam profile, because uh, your atomic flux and composition, all these things depending on energy density of the local energy density on the target. So when you do I want the one joule per square centimeter energy density, which means that average of every density, but in different regions have a different energy density. And because the beam profile in the center is high, but in the edge region beam profile drops like this. So we don't use all the beam profile, you cut it most apart. And you use a very flat top region because the energy profile coming like this. And then you actually throw away most of this part and, and use a very, very narrow regions of uniform top region because that is what you need. And then you bring profile. At the same time, another experience we do is actually most of laser beam comes like uh, this way. Okay? Beam is coming this way. And then when you come here, it's coming 45 degrees. Okay, the 45 degree like this, which means you come down to 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 my here is my target, this target, and beam coming in 45 degree like this. Okay, and then think about it, beam coming here, then you have to focus this target surface, and then this region this very long this region, then this wing focus this region on the focus, and then you want to focus this region this one you over focus. Okay, this this serious problem of the POD system. Okay, you don't want to have this under focus and over focus. How do you overcome this problem? Okay, the most laser coming this way, and then what you do? Yeah, I think this is the what the tricks that we have learned from from this one. You rotate this beam. Okay, because the laser beam is coming is all the XML laser is a rectangular shape beam profile, and then different laser has different one. So you rotate this beam from this one to this. Okay? Then your beam is coming this way, and you have less likely over focus on the focus. You, you understand that? So it's a lot of very trivial things, you know, thin film growth. A lot of people just ignore just a lot of small details. That makes a big difference your quality of materials you grow. No matter how you try to do work hard, and then this one. Growing here, stoichiometry of this one, stoichiometry of this region, you're coming this, different composition and different material. And you're trying to make uh, some optimizing this one hard, but you never be able to optimize it because the beam profile is over focus, under focus. And this region, that region, has a different energy density and a different way of coming out. Okay? So this one requires from here to here, if you know the simple optics, three meters. 
you have three meters, reflect three times, then you go from here to here, you can rotate it. Okay? If you, after this class and this lecture, if you want to do it, I'll tell you how to do that. Just by three UV meter, then you just reflect one, two, three, then you're coming from here to here. So once you rotate it, then you just use this beam, make sure that region, uniform region, cut it by aperture, then you use a lens to focus this. Okay, that's what the PLD uses. So these are small things, and then you have to do have a right optics, right distance, and then all these things is involved in this region. And that's why the quality of PLD influence varies a lot, and depending on how much you know, how much you control this. And sometimes we actually use beam profile, the image the beam profile, and then you have a, uh, some, some instrument, and you can actually image the whole thing then you know exactly what the energy profile is. I think that tells three-dimensional plot. And then you can cut it in good regions. So PLD, I do not want to talk about too much of this because uh, I already talked about it a little bit yesterday. But today I'm going to focus this lecture, first lecture today, is sputtering. The reason that I brought the sputtering here is you can actually use the sputtering any labs here and in existing chamber and then you just modify it, anybody can do, you, anybody can make a really high quality thin films, any compound you want to do, very easily can do it. And then that's what I'm going to talk about here today. Okay? And then, but it's a lot of interesting parameters you understand. It's a fundamental spotting is what the issue, why this is hard initially, and now what is the really make this one is really attractive. So most of people try many years this oxide thin film growth by sputtering or this geometry. Okay. And the sputtering is coming from but it's a composite target and then I just draw here strontium ruthenium oxide, strontium ruthenium oxide target and you have two different cations and strontium and ruthenium, an oxygen yellow one. Okay, so we have a three element, two cations and one L, one uh, anions. So the way sputtering works is you know that, and then either RF or DC. Then you need DC for conductive material, and RF you need insulating material. But basically, you can sputter any material, any limitation. In any melting temperature, <coughs> tungsten, even you can sputter sapphire, you can sputter any materials, no issue of temperature. Okay? So that is the beauty of this sputtering, and then you can actually use this. But the, you have a two ways you can think about. You want to do metal composite or ceramic composite. And then ceramic composite is flexible because you don't have to worry about oxidation at all. And so you have this ceramic composite, and the, some ceramics can be conductive, some ceramics can be insulated. And you can decide what kind of target, what kind of sputtering, depending on your material's conductivity. Okay? So that is some crossover, but I think you have, you can decide what, 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 what is the optimum one. So you basically you need target, is mounted on the spatter gun. Spatter gun is just the, you can actually buy spatter gun, maybe two, three thousand dollars in the, in the good spatter gun, but you can actually make your own spatter gun if you know how to do that. Just simple inside the anode, water cooled anode, you have a magnet, and then you have a ground shield, and that's all. It's very simple, and then, but I think you can easily can buy the spatter guns, and you the power supply, apply the voltage here. And negative bias to here and attract argon ions. Okay? The argon ions are attracted and then bombard, and then your sputter, strontium, and ruthenium, and oxygen all comes out. But a lot of people initially didn't realize what the serious problem of this sputtering. And the problem is, is that when you sputter, not just this metal, strontium and ruthenium, is uh, either neutral or you have ions. You can have a come out both. Okay? 
Because so when you sputter, when you break the bond, it can be ions or it can be neutral. And the ions can be easily can be combined with electrons become, become the neutral. But look at this, this oxygen is also cut out from the target because the ceramic target contains oxygen. When your oxygen comes out, this oxygen is oxygen minus two ions. And this one is a problem because you bias this one is bias negative bias because when you negative bias you minus like a few hundred volts and few hundred volts attract the positive ion to hit it knock out this but another this problem is this negative bias accelerate this oxygen ions very high energy okay so you have a few hundred EV you have a few hundred EV of the, this energy accelerating this oxygen ion, it, it, this material was already deposited. Okay? You know what happened this one? And it is my experience initially, I grow these thin films and ended up, I did nothing. I get nothing, but what I got is just etching of the material, etching of the sulfate. Because this energetic particle is much more stronger than, than depositing of this material. Not only back sputter this, even sputter back sputter front, uh, front uh, the, uh, and then substrate. This is even worse if you sputter fluoride. Okay? The fluoride is F minus, is ion, is very reactive, and then accelerate this one, then etch it very quickly. So you have an issue here, negative ion issue in all oxide deposition. That's why initially, many, many years, people tried to use the sputtering of this. Okay, sputtering doesn't work. Everybody give up, and then we don't want to do that. And that's a serious problem for many, initially, when high TC was discovered. Okay? So, you have a multiple approach. You can think of, well, overcome this problem. Maybe you can have a, very easily, you can think of what's the best approach to do that. And the two approach, we can think about two different approaches. <clears throat> Most of sputter deposition, and what you guys do to sputter deposition, and sputtering has only a few variables. Okay, very simple variables. One, what's the pressure of the partial pressure of the gas in it? And what's the power you apply this? And then power includes <coughs> what the voltage and what is the actual current on the target, which is automatically adjusted, and then temperature of your deposition. Very simple, that's it. Not much of flexibility of you can control this. And then, so when you do this initially, when you do this, sputtering, you do most of people's sputter, like the metals, and then a lot of people do sputtering, in the range of pressure, roughly three millitor to like the 10 millitor of that region. You, have, you know that the millitor, I mean, the one atmospheric pressure is 760 tor, and then that is roughly 3 to 10 millitor for the magnetron sputtering. Because the magnetron sputtering is a much more effective and higher flux. That's why they developed the magnetron sputtering. But the range of pressure relative, like a 3 to, like I said, 10 millitor of that range, okay? Because that is the most effective way and high your growth rate and then things like that. Okay? But those regions, you have mean free pass, it's a short, but not very short, it's still long. <coughs> so that means <coughs> this uh, oxygen coming out, scattered by these uh, argon gas molecules, but not strong enough, it reach that here, still very high energy <coughs> particle. Okay? So one approach people use, okay, simple approach. Why don't you put tons of gas in it? Okay? You put it in, like a 400 millitor, okay? The three to 400, you actually putting 100 times more argon gas in the chamber, okay, 100 times, which means 400 millitor or 600 millitor, that region, 100 times more, your mean phase is very, very short. Then it's oxygen ion scatters so many times, and when you reach here, and you lose most of energy, and then you don't have such kind of strong molecules, I mean, backsparting. But problem is, so many scattering, not only scatter this, scatter this one too. So that means, 
you don't get that oxygen, but you don't get this flux. So in order to overcome this problem, they actually sh distance very short. Usually sputtering, a lot of chambers sputter a distance like this far, some sputtering this far. But make this sputtering smaller, thinner and thinner, it's that small, like even five centimeter distance, okay? Very, very close. And that's one way you overcome this problem. But still, you have negative ion issue. And then, even though you have that high pressure. So another simple approach is, well, let's change the geometry. And geometry is that way. Then actually you can change the geometry and then remove this problem. And that's the problem we call this nitrogen effect structure. Okay? And then the, this technique is use a target is 90 degree, and then you apply the pressure is high enough, the pressure high enough, and then you have a lot of scattering. Your scattering is coming from the background gas, and then your diffusion is the main process of the flux. But oxygen ions never reach here. Oxygen ions going that direction. Okay? So this we call 90 degree of sputtering, and that has been initially is this is the first I tried this was many years of this geometry. Every time when you grow this superconducting interferon, it's not superconducting, or it can be like insulating because the stoichiometry is not correct. But the problem of this one is action here. It's not sputter all of them, sputter back sputtering of this selectively. Selectively means some elements sputter easily because sputter yield depending on mass, energy, a lot of things. So for example, this one selectively sputter ruthenium, not strontium. That means you ended up, you provide this flux, the one-to-one -one ratio, but you ended up actual thin films is not one-to-one, one, one to point five because you back sputter ruthenium a lot. So you ended up, stoichiometry is wrong. Even though your stoichiometry is 1 to 1 ratio, and your stoichiometry is 1 to 0.5. Well, initially, people what did is a very simple way to do, OK, you lose 50%, OK, why don't you add 50% more? They use a 2 to 1 ratio target and do it. But this is a trial and error. You change the tweaking a little bit, different element. You don't know exactly how composition of target you have to use. This is a, like a moving target. You are just shooting the moving target. Okay, so that's not a very smart way to do. So you have to do some techniques can allow you to one to one, and you get one to one. And then this technique actually allow you to grow stoichiometric film any oxide compound, and then because certain certain compound has a more ionic nature. The so ethylene barium carboxide is a one, of, one of the very ionic, very vulnerable to negative ion. Some oxide less vulnerable and uh, less uh, susceptible to negative ion, but you have a wide range of this negative ion problem. So simple way to do, okay, let's change the geometry and then solve all the problems of stoichiometry issue. As I said, in the beginning of this first slide, the stoichiometry control is the one most important thing you have to check when you grow the pentulums. If, if the stoichiometry is wrong, then there's crystal inequality, all the other all the things, there's no meaningful. Because your material is not the right material you are growing, and you have to control the stoichiometry exactly what you want. And this one allows you to do that. So, sputtering is off of sputtering very easy to set up. And inexpensive, you basically need sputter source, and you need a power supply, and then your growth itself is very reproducible. And then anybody can actually come in, and then you have a setup, and then your films, it run to run, is very reproducible. And another easy part we can think about, deposition is a very uniform large area. Because a personal laser deposition issue here, you perceive the laser beam focus very tiny spot. And then where area you can grow, uniform area, maybe maximum area you can grow, is maybe 10 
millimeter, uh, 10, uh, 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter, or 1 centimeter, 1 centimeter, maybe that's a maximum uniformity area. Beyond this, your composition and the thickness profile drop dramatically. So sputtering is an advantage here. You have a sputter gun, you can scale up. It's about a 2 inch, 3 inch in large size. You can scale up, but uniformity is a lot better, and then you can draw multiple films and the same composition and same condition, and you can grow multiple samples. And the other one is the film quality is very smooth, and initially we got the better films and by sputtering the PLD, because PLD creating a lot of borders and particles. And then because of this energetic photons, not only just creating atoms, but a lot of chunk of material coming from the target, and especially target density is not good enough, then you get a lot of particles. I think you have some experience, certain material system, you get a lot of particles and then POD, but sputtering is less susceptible to the particle issue. And the drawback is definition rate is relatively slow. But a lot of research environment, and then these days, you have a slow deposition is advantageous growing highest quality material because you have enough time to atoms move around and then you crystallize it. And then that's why a lot of MBE growth is growth tech growth takes a very long time, very slow. And then sputtering is relatively slow, but I think that's a, sometimes an advantage of so this. And important sputtering parameters, as I said, is only few important parameters. But I think I just want to make this one a list of these parameters and then gas pressure pressure. Basically, you put it in argon gas, sputter gas, and then oxygen reactive gas. And then total pressure range is 50 to 400 millitol range. But I think this one can be, you can tune. And then once you fix it, and you can have pretty reproducible growth. And geometry already fixed, whatever distance here, your distance here, what the distance here, what's the distance here, depending on the size of target and size of here. But you can get easily two inch area, you can uniformly deposit in you know, two inch diameter area with this. And then you have here, you have a, the bias voltage. I mean, this is pretty much determined by this uh, your sputter gun. And then RF case, you have a, like RF power sparring, usually run it 100 watts of the power because uh, you have uh, too much power on your target, target actually melt. It's uh, too much energy. Because even though you cool this, certain targets, ceramic targets, thermal conductivity is not as good as the metal. And uh, you don't want to hit too much of the ion energy on the local area. So we have uh, usually run it 100, 100 watts. And then magnetic configuration is uh, mostly like planar magnet transporting. So I think it's pretty much fixed when you buy your sputter gun already fixed, and the sputtering a target is a diameter, and that actually scale up, and then you can have a substrate temperature. So this temperature is, a, is, is for uniform for all the deposition temperature, uh, deposition techniques. So that means basically what you have to control, number one, and number two, and number four, five, that's it. Very simple, and then once you set this one, every run is supposed to be very producible. And then, uh, so let me just uh, introduce the, this distinct difference between this on-axis sputtering and off-axis sputtering, how much different this case. When you do on-axis sputtering here, and you see that this composition of yttrium, barium, copper, the composition cross the sample here. You know how this one is uniformity is terrible here because certain region the uniformity is really bad. And the problem here, uniformity is worse uniformity in certain region here, is because of your target here is a, this particle coming from this uh, erosion area is a ring pattern, the ring shape of pattern. And those region has the highest like a negative ion flux. So whenever you hit the highest negative ion region, you get the most serious a negative ion bombardment. So you see the non-uniformity is coming from which region has more negative ions. And but not only non-uniformity, it still accumulates a lot of off composition. So that's why 
it's not, it's a lot of struggle. But using just changing, changing this uh, geometry, your composition is pretty uniform over the uh, area, like a two inch area. And the thickness and the composition is very uniform. And then is the property is very, very uniform. So I think it's, this is the one thing you can easily can use composite targets and take this one, mount it, and use it. So this is a geometry we actually use. Uh, because erosion pattern is, is usually magnet is a, uh, the dot, like a button magnet, and outside the ring magnet here, donut magnet. So the erosion pattern is like a dark region here. So then I think we have a negative line more coming here. And you, this is the geometry I draw here. So when you look at this geometry, okay, so you want to get small size of sample, like a 10 centimeter, or 10, or 10 millimeter or 10 millimeter, or like a few samples of 10 millimeter or 10 millimeter samples, and you don't need to do anything just to grow this influence. But I want to grow uniformity large area. Okay, like a, I want to grow three inch wafers. I want to grow uniform area three inch wafers. How can you do by PLD? You grow on PLD, one approach people use for PLD, and then you use like a scanning of the actual target. It takes a lot of time to scan this, cover the whole region, 10 inch by 10 inch by mask covered, and then that's one. But in here, as long as you understand flux profile, what is the flux profile looks like, and then we just measure the flux profile. And this is a profile of our flexi spot train, a thickness profile. Okay, not composition profile, a thickness profile. So composition is a lot more forgiving than thickness profile. Okay? So that means composition here, composition here is not much different. But thickness drops here a lot. Okay? So in order to overcome, and then this one, this is done like by just a measurement of the matrix. It's like here. You measure the thickness of this wafer of 8-inch wafer area, for example. If you have 8-inch, this a whole 8-inch wafer. You deposit this, measure the thickness, and this profile. Okay. So this is a plateau or top region, but drops a lot. Then you can find this rotation. You rotate this, then you have to average the thickness, and you can get a large, large uniform area. So that can be done finding this one exactly where the rotation axis. We can define it by simple, simple simulation, right? You know that, that the profile, fixed profile, and where is the optimum axis of rotational axis. Okay? That can be done easily by a computer programming. And you find, for example, okay, I want a rotational axis here. And this region, this axis is a symmetric, but this axis is a symmetric. Okay? So symmetric or symmetric. So this is a erosion pattern of this one, like two inch and the three inch target. You have a different things, so you can actually use a different size of target and then monitor the thickness. And you can see that two inch target is much drops faster than this one is a three inch target. Okay, so you have a self size voltage versus forward power, and then this is what the uh, depending on power and bias voltage you have the few hundred to two hundred volts, which is you cannot really control. Is actually is determined by your calculation, but you can see that the three inch target, your profile is better than two inch target, but not as not dramatically different. Okay, but obviously this one is a percentage thickness, but actual rate is faster because you have flux from the three inch target is higher. So advantage of larger diameter target is higher flux and also better uniformity without rotation. But you can actually do additional advantage of this under the direction. You can see that this way and that way, you can have uh, two different axes. This one is axis scanned along that direction. And then this direction is y direction is, a, is that one. And x direction is that one. So you can average this. Once you average this and rotating substrate, you get this kind of profile. And without state rotation profile of drops like this. So that means you can have a relatively uniform deposition, and then this is like a plus minus 10% or plus minus 5% average. You can actually define it, what is the range of the uniformity you can design actually this rotational axis.
Okay, that is a you can sometimes the reason initially is the large area uniformity is important. I want to grow microwave device or superconductor microwave device on wing chip or two inch wafer because you want to make a, like a streamlined resonators a lot of those things. You need the wafer this size wafer to do that. And sometimes I want to do processing a piezo device. Okay, one of the piezo MEMS, for example, and I need to use large wafers, not the small size wafers, because they allow you to do by silicon integration, oxide and silicon, the silicon wafer is, comes with a two, three, four, five, six, eight inch wafer. So this one can be scaled up, and this one actually demonstrate up to eight inch, at the three inch diameter target, you can get eight inch wafer area uniformly covered within plus minus whatever five, 10 percent region, okay? So that is a very attractive, and then other techniques is much harder to adapt to this, but this one is simply, you have a simple rotation, a spiral target, and then those things. And there's a composition of this composition measurement and composition each bearing crop oxide relatively uniform here. And then a lot of composition as we do is a, a wavelength dispersed to X-ray spectrum, a spectroscopy measurement, and the error bar is actually is, is relatively small. And then that's what you get. Okay. So this is actually superconducting change in temperature. You can see how sharp the transition. And the spotter, it's a very half of 10 films. And you can see that 91 Kelvin. It's a very high GC temperature. And then this is as good as one of the best 10 films you can grow. And how sharp the transition, you can see that from here to here, a very sharp transition. And then you can normal state resistivity is quite good. And then this is typical, you can get super, uh, the optics spotter. You can use this technique for all other materials. And then this I encourage you to have to try if you want to try something new material system. Very easy to do. Okay, I'm going to skip this one because I'm going to go about uh, an hour now. But, okay, one of the advantages of sputtering is versatile, uniform area, and you produce so very easy. But, can you do same kind of in situ monitoring for the spot train. No one has done that yet. The personal label definition, I show that high pressure read and control that atomic layer control. And the spot train, people never tried this. And the one of the people, reason why they didn't try it, is, uh, is a read, is you have a magnet. Spotter gun has a magnet. You have a magnet inside, in the chamber, then you bend the electron beams. You bend the electron beam, then your actual read does not effectively work as the PLD. Because when you do PLD in the read, you have to do a lot of shielding, get some kind of uh, new metal shielding, so you have to avoid some magnetic field. And then so the digital control by sputtering is, is a lot of advantage. And then interesting oxide you can grow between bearing crop up, strontium luthene, and one of the best, like a, like a super lattice is by Gron, uh, John Mark Triscon's group and uh, University of Geneva. And this one is a lanthium nickelate, lanthium manganate. That's a 111 orientation as an exchange bias, but 100 doesn't have exchange bias. This published in Nature, Nature Materials in 2012. They used this material spotry by super lattices. And very high quality super lattice, you can see that the super lattice reflections and a very uniform smooth, like an atomically flat surfaces and grown by sputtering. But they didn't use in situ monitoring. They just measured the, actually your rate, grow thick film, they measure the rate, divide the time, then you know what the rate per second. And then you just multiply this time to grow whatever you need cell to grow. For example, they want to grow, I want to grow five in itself and five in itself, then you actually use a time to control those things. But they get the beautiful data by sputtering, and then you have a beautiful physics and beautiful science they've done by sputtering. Okay. Not many groups are doing it uh, at this point, but I think this is a potential is a very useful and a very strong uh, the capability. And then sputtering is different from POD and MBE, and then combined with sputtering to access a new material space is one of the advantages. Okay? So,
Can you do this one? Yes, we can do that. But the design here is a normal design. is the phosphorus screen, and then your sputter gun here, okay? And the heater, the offlet sputter, like this is sputter, the target, uh, target is here, and this is the, uh, the heater block, and E gun coming in, and then you can see the read pattern, oscillation, and this one can be oscillate tilting and azimuthal, and you can control the read pattern. And the challenge here, as I said, magnetic field. Okay? The magnetic field is, is coming from the spider gun, and the spider gun magnetic field can bend this mag the electron field. Second problem is your background gas here is a lot of argon. Argon has a heavier than oxygen, so your scattering by argon is more severe than oxygen, and then that's another one. So we look at this magnetic field pattern here. This is a console simulation. And you can do a lot of electromagnetic uh, the, uh, the simulation. And the sputter magnet, and then creating a lot of magnetic field. And then that actually, because this, without magnetic, magnetic field, your spot is very symmetric here. But when you bring magnetic field, you have bending the magnet is like this. Okay? So not very symmetric. So that means, Still, we can actually use this information to actually monitor the growth, but not perfectly ideal. And then there's a vacuum, and then you have a magnetic field is bending this one. So I think it's not, we still can do monitor this oscillation of this, we can do it, but you can see that from this pattern, you can tell, but you want to make this one more flat and a nice peg. And then, so you can actually see that with oxygen and argon, the oxygen scattering is much less than argon. Okay? Because uh, you can just clear even the same pressure of the gas oxygen, 75 millitor, and they're very bright, but argon scatter a lot more. So the more stringent requirement to grow this material system. Okay, so now is argon scattering cross section area four times larger than oxygen. And then, then you have playing the vacuum and vacuum and 200 millitol, you get high pressure and then you get a lot of like a diffuse scattering. So what you did here initially, okay, even you have this kind of issue, and then your on axis and off axis you try both ways. And you can still see that this oscillation, not as clear as a PLD, but you can actually do this. And then even off axis sputtering, you get a lot of oscillation here, but this noise level is higher because background pressure is high. But still we can actually see very similar type of work, like a PLD and the sputtering, <coughs> and then you can adapt, adapt to this one for, for this deposition. And then and then just try this uh, different material like a lantern strontium manganese. You can see that this pattern is sort of bending like this. And you have a oscillation is very clear. So depending on materials, you can see the very clear oscillation, layer by layer growth, and lantern strontium manganese. Which means you can use very simple technique like a PLD, but your sputtering can do a lot more degree of freedom, uniformity, and different materials. Even you can use in situ monitoring by sputtering. And then, so we can have really control, atomic layer controlled growth, and by office sputtering. And this is another PLD grown LSMO, and the sputter grown LSMO. And you can see the pattern here, a bit of a band here, but you can actually see the same thing. Okay, so this one, so we have a strontium today, and then we actually see very similar. I'll talk about this later because I haven't covered this one yet. But you can transition from layer by layer growth to cephalo growth, and you have seen this, and you have seen the same thing in strontium today, and we can see the same thing here. And but in the in the strontium today in sputter case, we do not see the cephalo growth all the way. We go to the uh, the, uh, the two dimensional growth because of step growth and the two different techniques and a different regime of the parameter space and one goes to cephalo, one goes to uh, the, uh, 
the uh, uh, the uh, two-dimensional ion growth, but actually you can study growth mode and the layer by layer control, and you can do e from the position large area, and most importantly, you can grow stoichiometric influence. Okay, so. I think this surface roughness, and then you have a thickness oscillation of spider film with as good as the PLD. But one thing we have to use this uh, com computer simulation of the console allow you to design your chamber to minimize your magnetic field actually pattern. So use the simulate magnetic field pattern, and then when you do that, using single target, like this optic spot ring, using one target. If you one target, E gun actually electric field bent this much. So that means you miss the screen. Okay? So this, oh, and then you have a geometry, we don't, you don't know exactly where you put it in. When you do, you have a, this a bending of this, you have a offset spot ring bending that way, in the plane, bending this direction, so this this way. I think this is a top view or this side view. Okay, can you see that? This spider gun, offex spider gun, and there's a heater, the substrate sitting here, electron gun, coming, going like this, coming like this, like this. See that? Go like this. So that means so your screen is sitting here, it go bend like this, then you have to put this one up here. It's overcome to do that. You have to use simulation to can solve this problem, and then using compensating the magnetic field using another gun the other side. That's a simple way to do. Okay, can you compensate it? So about two guns. Okay, your two guns is an advantage. Two guns, you have a two materials. Maybe super lattice you want to grow one material, other material, and the two of those, and then you have the even though you don't use the second guns, they compensate the magnetic field. And then allow two guns are needed for super lattices and multi layers. But you can see that these two guns is even worse. Worse than single gun, but depending on your polarity of magnets. <coughs> because so when you do your magnet, you have an intercenter magnet and the ring magnet, and then you have end pole and then outside is S-pole, the magnetic field come out like this. But you have other guns, you can do either same polarity or reverse polarity, and then make the plasma configuration different, but at the same time, your magnetic field pattern always different. So we can compensate this. So the easy way to do is to compensating this, so it's like an anti-symmetric magnetic gun or a symmetric magnetic gun. So you have a change in this anti-symmetric gun, you can see straight beam. This is a very simple thing. You don't have to think about the complicated one. Okay, just changing this polarity, can you see this one and that one? Okay, so this blue and red, can you see that one? Anti-symmetric, but the previous one is red and red. That means your polarity is a symmetric gun make this kind of even worse than single gun, but you can use a two gun geometry, make a straight beam. So now you have even more attractive than without read gun. Sputtering is so attractive, you can actually use not only growing high quality oxide influence, but you can grow superlatis multi-layers, real in situ, real time monitoring of this technique using very simple. So when you buy your spider gun, make sure your two spider guns anti-symmetric magnetic field. And then if that's the case, and then your, your beam is go straight. And you can actually see that beam is straight. And this is all the simulation of this. So you can actually have a nice read pattern of this. So we built this chamber in our lab. And then use two spider guns with the read guns. And then it, it, so when you set it up, it right on our four fast screen. We hit it. Initially, we, we couldn't see it. Now, at the do it, the beam is, is center of the phosphor screen. So, I think this is not very difficult. You can actually adopt, adapt this one, and then you can use, and then and then grow high pressure, 
and then in situ read and multi layers, it can do that and a very nice technique of this. And the symmetric is, is a comparison of this, is a, is a very uh, serious bending problem. Okay, so now I think we have, you have a two spotagons face to face, and then in that case, with the advantage of two spotagons, you can use two different materials and different material systems. For example, I can use this one is a lanthanum nicolate, or you can use a lanthanum manganate. So that's what John Mark Chriscon's group published paper in Nature Materials, and you have two different material superlattices, but you can use a two material, same materials deposited without rotation, you get more uniformity and thin film size area. So you can have a flexibility of making single material or multiple material you can do, and that's something you can really consider. That. And then you can design your chamber more clever way. Then you can do more than two. You can do multiple targets you can do, and then constant simulation we did. So our new chamber has multiple actually targets rather than two, so you can deposit many of those. And another advantage of this system, and then only not only read, and then your chamber is relatively compact. And spotagon is getting very compact, like two inch target is that much, and you can have everything in the small area. Okay. So I'm going to stop it here, and then I take uh, some questions in the break and come back. And the second next subject is something like very more specific, and I can give you some example of the your stoichiometric control, like extreme stoichiometric control. What that mean? Stoichiometric control, I didn't talk about 0.01% or better. And how many point defects you're talking about? And the next one, I think we talk about the second one, like uh, yesterday we did. I can give up one example, specific example, address stoichiometric issue, and then, then uh, we can learn more second lecture. So I can take some questions about this, but I think I can spend one hour, I cannot cover all the techniques. I better cover is techniques, you can, it's a very attractive technique you can use, and then easy adaptable, you can use that in the lab. Okay? Any questions? I think that's pretty much of it. Yeah, four guns, we can multiple guns. Yeah, you can do design of this. But anyway. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, sir, my question is uh, for the off axis sputtering, how does the uh, film uniformity and stoichiometry depend on the uh, distance between your target and the substrate? Okay. So, roughly the distance, you can optimize the distance, but usually you can actually see sweet spot. It's, it's a distance, it's a basically you have a avoid direct beam of negative ion. So when you have this off-axis spotagon this way, if you go too far down, okay, there's a two degree of freedom, this distance or this distance, okay? So this distance far down, then your diffusion takes longer, your rate slow down, but you're less likely hit negative ion spread. The negative ion not coming just straight beam, negative ion coming this way, because a lot of flux is a sine cosine law. Okay? Cosine law is all the flux. So it's a cost is coming like this. Okay? So it's coming like this, so that means you're very close to the middle, bottom, you can move very close. But if you're far, then you still your negative ion, because negative ion coming, coming this way. You, you, you understand that? The cosine law. So you have to really optimize this, but it's a very it's not actually very sensitive to do that. So you want to have a distance, maybe this one half centimeter, half, half inch distance, and then this distance, you go, you don't know what underneath here. You have to go that way. And you go this, not too far, because if you go too far, you hit by this negative ion, and also your rate is slow, because of your far distance. So increasing the uh, voltage or uh, power will uh, take care of the position Yes, because of, in sputtering case, that position rate is not power. That position rate is a current density. So in, in DC, 
Yeah, the, in the deep sea sparkling, you, have, you can read the three different modes. You have voltage, power, and current. And the current is the way you determine the actual rate. Because uh, your current density is the one. And then normally, you see that your know, bias voltage is roughly range of 50 volts to 200-300 volts, that range. And then if you have a too high voltage, your energetic article is more likely higher. So it's better to have a low self-vice voltage that's more attractive. But if you go low self-vice voltage, you get more current because of the power divided by your, your, your device voltage. That's current density. So you get scale. Your scales when you go higher voltage and higher, and higher, higher power and higher current density. But you cannot go too far because you actually melt your target. Because it's not melt the target whole area, a lot of problems happen locally. You heat it up too high because uh, your ceramic target summer conductivity is very poor. Good question. Yes. Yes. Sir, in opaxin sputtering, collision cross section plays a role or not? Say again. Cross section of collision cross section of different atoms. It does play a role in deciding the stoichiometry of the thin film or not? Distortion of stoichiometry of the thin film which we are depositing. A stoichiometry. Yeah. Your stoichiometry of thin film. Yeah. Compared to PLD? No. Or actually the uh, different items which are coming out of the substrate. The okay. Collision cross section with argon uh, ions. Does it matter? Yeah, no it doesn't matter. The sputtering is the process. You have to think about the sputtering is initial target. Okay, we have initial fresh target. Sputtering yield of different elements are different. Okay, for example, you look at chart, you look at the chart, you're depending on mass or different element, and the sputtering yield is the energy, you can, you can find all these things. But sputtering initially is all the elements sputter differently. But once you reach the steady state, surface actually sputter, surface composition may not be the exact bulk composition, and reach the steady state. And then that steady state maintained. And then flux is maintained with constant same stoichiometry. So very careful is that when you do sputtering, don't sputter right away. You have to pre-sputter. And then make steady state condition. So is ideally you buy a new target, you pre-sputter for a while, make a conditioning. But each time when you actually grow things, maybe pre-sputter a little bit using the shutter. Then once you reach that steady state, you can actually see that from monitoring your bias voltage. And once you reach that, open your shutter and start depositing. That's the most ideal way to do. So one more thing, if I I already having excess oxygen in my substrate, can I reduce the oxygen by some reduction process during deposition in the using the PID? You have already oxygen in the substrate. Yeah. Strontium tight strontium tight substrate has oxygen. Yeah, suppose I have SRTIO4 and I want SRTIO3 thin films using PLD. Can I do reduction in the chamber itself in some way to decrease the oxygen content? Or decrease the oxygen content yeah. of your thin film yeah. during the deposition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want to have oxygen content less than yes. your bulk yeah. bulk material. Okay. So you have a Depending on your, your compound, allow you to do that. Certain compound is oxygen, oxygen stoichiometry varied a lot. Depending on how, you, how much you put it in. For example, some kind of cobaltate, and a lot of papers about cobaltate, like lanthanum, barium cobaltate, that's just strong cobaltate. Your oxygen stoichiometry can change the different phases in between. And then you can do that. But certain compound, you have only line compound. You cannot change the stoichiometry. Like uh, aluminum oxide, very hard to change aluminum oxide to aluminum oxide minus something. Okay, very stable. And then that depending on your material. I don't know your material has how much freedom to do that. And if you have a material has freedom to do that, you control the oxygen partial pressure, and then you can have a range of oxygen stoichiometry. But you have additional duty of freedom to control the stoichiometry post annealing. After you deposit at high temperature, you cool down that pressure, you vent oxygen, 
and then annealing high temperature cool down. So you have a post annealing as another actually another degree of freedom. You can actually use the control of the stoichiometry. Is that the question? Why should you answer? Maybe you can talk about the tea time. Okay. Any more questions about this sputtering? Yes. Films drawn by sputtering and uh, those PLD, does it change some characteristic uh, property of superconducting material in terms of a critical current density and some other HC2, etc.? No. Actually, it more depending on who grows the film, probably. But I think that initially, when you look at the sputter films, has a different characteristics of the PLD initially. But we thought this one is a different techniques. But the later is when you grow, optimize the conditions. And as you can see that, TC is very similar to PLD grown thin films. And then for PLD grown thin films, you have to be very careful. If a lot of particles is cuprate materials. When you do cuprate material PLD, you see a lot of boulders. Because you cuprate is sometimes like a chunk of material come out from the target. But sputtering less susceptible to do that because this is more like an atomic, atomic flux rather than cluster deposition. And PLD is like sometimes the cluster come out rather than atoms. Sometimes what happens is just for creating more vacancies and kind of things, green boundaries, etc. Uh, the JC varies in general. Like JCs? Yeah, so probably it could affect JC, not at least at C2. But may possible JC may vary because of more uh, defects and some kind of... You mean the ex-situ thin film or in-situ thin films? Uh, I mean, if uh, films are grown differently, like mm -hmm. due to variation in some kind of defects and like some extra defects and vacancies, it may create some variation in JC. Okay, so critical condensity has a lot of, not just a composition issue. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the critical condensity superconductor, I think we can talk about that. Uh, they, uh, later too, but the it's a physical properties. It's not only depending on composition, especially critical run density. Critical run density is okay, depending on your microstructure, but also flux pinnings. Okay, you have some kind of defects, advantages for flux pinning. So that means you have the gross material perfect, like a no defects, like a boxing or crystal then critical density is so low because no flux pinning centers. Mm -hmm. And then, but the thin films you grow, low temperature, you get a lot of twin boundaries or some kind of other dislocations and all these defects, yes. and critical density a lot higher. So what is the better samples? High critical density sample better or low critical density perfect single crystal better? And answer is both are important. Depending on what is the use of your material, to study this. I want to demonstrate this uh, YBC or the uh, superconducting thin film samples for the application of like a high magnetic field application and flux spinning and then all these kind of thing, then which is thin film is better. But you want to do something very, very clean and defect, low density defect, certain kind of intrinsic characteristics, maybe boxing crystal is better, but it should very hard boxing crystal, very hard to oxidize, very long distance. So sputter films, and initially, when you initially reported, critical density came out 10 to the 7 amps per second, so a few times 10 to the 7 amps per second, right, at 4.2 Kelvin. It's so high, we're surprised why it's so high, but maybe some lot of flux pinning because the film's grown at low temperature rather than very, very high temperature. And also other ones, the grain boundaries, yes. and how clean the grain boundaries, and that also determines that. <clears throat> Any more questions? Okay, so then uh, we can take a break and then come back. And then uh, one another subject, which is uh, point defect. And also I want to introduce very interesting gross technique. And then uh, maybe that's something future um, the project. All right? Thank you.
the very versatile technique of uh, office sputtering. And then um, they can be used uh, for many different types of complex outside. And then even you can use in situ monitoring. And then uh, the first question uh, in the second lecture is can you really achieve a perfect stoichiometry of the material? Uh, I think this one never been an issue for many years. But I think recently this is a very, very important issue in complex oxide field. And then uh, because the lot of fundamental science we are working on this complex oxide is, is really didn't actually go that kind of deeper level and even didn't know how to achieve the perfect. And we thought we thought it's perfect but had to realize it's not perfect stoichiometry. So this part of the today's lecture, uh, the, the second lecture, is related to perfect stoichiometry of this system. And then this uh, stoichiometry of stoichiometry is actually offers other the functionality. And then you have, a, you have a two sides of the things, either, either you need off stoichiometry or you need a good perfect stoichiometry. You have both ways advantages. So I'm going to give a today second one, like a lecture I did yesterday. I'm using specific example of the science. Then starting from there, answer these questions later. So this one is is work is related to the answer uh, yesterday that one of the professor asked me about the ferroelectricity of strontium titanate. And then uh, this one is emergence of room temperature ferroelectricity and reduced dimension in strontium titanate. But origin of this stoichiometry of the new phenomena, emergent phenomena, is coming from very slight off stoichiometry creating point defects, which is point defects is the origin of this uh, new phenomena. And that doesn't really this is a good thing. But also the bad thing, certain types of electronic application, for example, mobility of low temperature mobility of this strontium titanate, superconductivity, other types of material properties, and then this defect can be an issue. But I want to introduce something good first, then I want to go to talk about how to get rid of this and some other purpose. So this is actually in the 2015, and we have published that. But I think the background of this is actually late to stoichiometry of this material. So initially, I think strontium titanate is not ferroelectric at all. And the certain groups actually reported strontium titanate is ferroelectric. And then people didn't believe initially, OK, how come strontium titanate is ferroelectric? And then this is the work done by the, uh, the Korean group here. And then this is the, we call this focus space mapping. It's showing is a strain and the lattice parameter of the material thin films grown on the substrate. I'll talk about that later because I haven't talked about this X-ray diffraction yet. And this, uh, this focus space is H and L. This is a HKL, which is a X, Y, Z in the real space, and the HKO, and then you have this uh, definition of this substrate, strontium titanate. The substrate is a 0, 0, 1 reflection. And then you have a strontium titanate, uh, these are, these are, it's a thin films. On top of this, it's spread a little bit. And then electrode, the strontium lucidate bottom electrode, everything lined up here in the H direction which means everything fully coherent. Okay. Which coherent means substrate lattice parameter big, and then your film is that, and substrate that, so all different layers they can use, a layer of the implant lattice parameter, but it's uh, actually everything coherent, all lined up, perfect circuit, uh, perfect uh, coherent blocks. And then, so when you look at this one, from the tetramality, they see that strontium titanate is, is ferroelectric, but from this measurement, your tetramality, your, your expansion, is a lot higher than bulk material. 
But the origin of this one is not coming from intrinsic. It's coming from a lot of defects. It's a sputtering of the PLD, it's a bombardment, and it's not real strontium titanate. It's off stoichiometry or very bad off stoichiometry film. I think that's one is strontium titanate ferroleptic. And then, so this a large off stoichiometry can create uh, this one, but it's a very tight and single crystal compared to do this, and then it's a large tetragonality, you can actually see that, and you can see you deposit low pressure oxygen, and more than like a, a high pressure oxygen, and low pressure one is a more defects because you have a oxygen vacancy creating volume get bigger, because this is the main reason, and then creating this uh, ferroelectricity is, is a lot of oxygen vacancies. Okay. So that's what they reported this one. But also we have found that uh, um, so many years ago, I mean, the, we have the, the work on strontium titanate, we believe, and this strontium titanate is the cumulative film, and we posited first laser deposition, and then this uh, measurement, a direct constant measurement, and then PR measurement, you see the low temperature, you start to see some kind of like a strain films, and then you have this kind of ferroelectric polarization, and even strain-free film, it has no strain at all, strontium titanate on strontium titanate, and you have a no the uh, remnant polarization. <coughs> However, when you measure the PFM measurement as a function of time, and then you have some kind of decay of this uh, polarization, it's actually strain filly film, and the strain film, and they really fast the decay, but initially, you can have certain type of radiation inside the material. Okay, so this is uh, something background of something is going on in strontium titanate. At that time, we actually conclude that strontium titan has a nanopolar regions, which means your ferroelectric like polar regions is so patched in between the matrix of dielectrics. So it's a, not everything is a ferroelectric is a small patch of those things and they embed it in the dielectrics. So that means it's not long range is connected to each other. So if macroscopic you measure it, you don't see it. But certain measurement shows indication of ferroelectric like behavior at room temperature. Okay? You understand this one? So certain is a is, is uniformly the material you're supposed to be complete dielectric, strontium tiny dielectric room temperature. But you have a very small patch, is like a ferroelectric like material, we call it nanopolar region. So that's NPR or PNR, polar nano region, something of you think PNR. Polar nano regions embedded in the matrix of dielectrics. But this one is all isolated and that doesn't do anything. Okay? But specific, like this measurement shows some indication of it. So what we have to do, originally we studied this one is, is, is not the point defect studies we studied. We actually studied this nanoscale, the ferroelectricity and strontium titanate. And one of the important question people is asking is what's, when you go reduce the dimension, your ferroelectric material lose the ferroelectricity at low dimension. Okay, because there's a lot of theory papers talking about uh, this one. It, like a size effect, this is a theory paper, is a nature paper, and then so when you grow barium titanate, this is a barium titanate ferroelectric in, in the at room temperature. But when you reduce the dimension, smaller and smaller, like uh, this one is M equal 10, 10 unit cell, and A unit cell, 6 unit cell, is smaller and smaller, and you have uh, this kind of energy, low energy here, and then you get the ferroelectricity. At some point, you don't have like a, like a plateau at the bottom, and you lose the ferroelectricity. So there's a reduce the dimension, and you lose the ferroelectricity, and then this is the work initially, mechanism to understand, overcome size effect. That's one of the reasons we have to study. And then the starting point here is, is coming from Many years ago, we thought about some nanopolar regions embedded in here. 
then can it be ferroelectric if that is embedded in the matrix region? So think about very simple question. You have all solid, even in the most perfect crystalline contained defects in resulting in local disorder, and that is we call normal nanopolar regions, like a small dot local inhomogeneity capable of creating polar nano region, PNR, in dialectics. This is actually like a ferroelectric like region, but it's actually matrix of dielectric. So when you apply electric field, and you don't feel anything. You cannot really switch this one. Do you, do you understand this one? Okay. Then, one thing you can think of here, well, can you make this one ferroelectric? Okay, so PNR is initially we realize that PNR, polar nano regions, when you grow film at the time, we measure the Raman measurement. Raman mode actually shows something polar mode of certain mode of the uh, Raman measurement. So you look at these two, and then this is the the, uh, the films. There are different types of film: boxing crystal STO, and then here nearly stoichiometric STO. But films we have off the cake STO, you have a very strong peak here coming from certain polar peaks. And then we have a single crystal doesn't have one, but thin films have these kind of peaks. Okay? That is coming from the polar and then in, in the uh, in the mode of the uh, uh, in the Brahman mode. And then but why it didn't so show any ferroelectricity in this one? Because it's uh, embedded in between but Raman measure everywhere. So the ideal first starting point is, is what is the nanopolar region? What caused this nanopolar regions? And then is in the pure strontium titanate. So we did some literature search, and some literature shows that it's a stable defects in strontium titanate, the titanium antisite defect in strontium vacancy site. For example, you have an almost perfect stoichiometry, but you have a very, very slight of stoichiometry, a strontium deficient. Okay? The strontium deficient, then you have a two possible defects. One is strontium vacancy. For example, you have 99%, okay, you have a 1 and 0.99. One is one is uh, titanium, 0.99 strontium. You have an extra strontium, extra titanium. So you have an extra titanium, you have two ways you can create, actually compensate this. One way, strontium is vacant, because you have a less amount of strontium. Or, you have a strontium site, is titanium goes to strontium site. This is called anti-site disorder. Okay, you know, point defects going to A site, your B site atom goes to A site, that's what we call anti site one. And that's a known defects calculation previously. And we did the calculation that is, is really polar or not. So we asked the DFD calculation and calculated is if we have a strontium in this anti site, titanium and strontium site, what is the actual size of the polarization of this. So they, we work that collaborate with the DFT person and measure three by three by supercell calculation and measure what is the actual polarization. And this polarization shows quite high polarization around the 60 microcolumbus centimeter at the center of this region. The reason of this polar like the nature of this, think about this. You remember that I showed the bedroom titanate, the titanium atom ions is shifted in the middle, right? The up and down, up and down with respect to the uh, oxygen. Remember that the first lecture I show you? And the strontium site, strontium minus two, plus two is a lot bigger than titanium plus four. So the ionic size is a lot smaller than actually size of the vacancy. So that when you go, <coughs> the, 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 the titanium goes in, and this one is not in the middle, it's a shifted. Okay? So energetically more stable, it's shifted from the center, it's so like 0.8 angstrom is off.
from the center, which is, is a polar. Okay? So the calculation, and then this energy calculation is a large variation, and also your polar direction is either 1, 0, 0, is more stable. So the, the direction of this shift is along the 1, 0, 0 direction, not the 1, 1, 1, or 1, not polar axis step. So this is a large off-center of anti titanium atom, <laughs> And then this one reasonable barrier for the switching here. So there's a switching from here, switching here, going back and forth. And the natural formation of PMR, strontium titanium, intrinsic point effects. Which means not perfect stoichiometry, but they're creating anti site that makes polar nanoregions. Then, how do you make this one aromatic? Okay? So, these are nanopolar regions is actually in the matrix like this. Because this one is no particular screening of this, and that's completely random. Okay? Orientation of polar regions, completely random. So you know to make this one in a bulk like this, so that's when you measure this, is a paraelectric. And then size of PNR is a very, very tiny, nanometer scale. So, simple thing is from the intuition, can you reduce this to very thin? Then, these nanopolar regions touching the bottom electrode, touching the surface. Okay? If that happens, and you have an absorbate on the surface, and bottom electrode make this region look like ferrolactic. Okay? This is very simple. Uh, Simple thinking is when you have a nanopolar region, the so length scale of this thickness, length scale of the nanopolar region, we don't know what the size of nanopolar regions, but when you approach to get thinner and thinner and thinner, you approach the size of the nanopolar region, you will be able to see the ferrolacticity. That's a very uh, IO hypothesis in the beginning. Okay? So, can you test this? A stabilizing polarization of PNR or interfacial compensation. Because your polarization can be screened by like a metallic free like electrons, and then the bottom electrode, top electrode, and the bottom electrode, and then your top electrode has different screening power, and then that's why you have this. But you can switch over this one. So we actually talked to this one to phase field simulation, not previously with the DFT calculation three by three by three supercell calculation to, to measure the polarization, to determine the polarization. But here, phase field simulation actually measure, you know, it can be stable when you reduce the thickness and then this polarization value, macroscopic polarization value, how it happens. Okay? So this is the mutation, rela uh, relation steps, and then your simulation step, your time scale. And then your time scale, you have a thickness is a thick. And this, when you switch the polarization, it just dies so quickly, very similar to what I show a PFM measurement, previously like a time scale measurement of our, uh, the uh, PRL paper. And then when you get thinner and thinner, at a certain point, and it doesn't die, it will maintain, maintain this polarization infinite amount of time. Okay? So you have a crossover here, certain crossover of when you reduce the thickness, when you're touching this one, top and bottom electrode, this one becomes very stable ferroelectric. Okay? So that's our hypothesis. So we're gonna test this. You look at the polarization as a function of thickness, and thickness gets thinner and thinner, and then your polarization goes higher and higher, but the higher thickness polarization is so low, and that's not stable. So we grow this one, first laid to the position, using single target which means using strontium titanium as a single crystal target. But when you transfer this to the target, you never be able to get exactly the same composition. It's maybe 0.1% off. That's still enough to create this kind of point defects embedded in between. And then you make this one bottom electrode strontium ruthenate. So we make a screening, screening of this bottom electrode <coughs> right here. You need a bottom electrode and the strontium ruthenate. So first you deposit strontium ruthenate first, then you grow the strontium titanate, different thickness of strontium titanate, 
either 12 inch cell or 16 inch cell, uh, varying the thickness of film and trying to measure when you really see the crossover. Okay, so you draw this, this you count number of this oscillation, then that's a number in itself. And here is a really important, you have a precise control of number in itself. So when you measure this, and the strontium leucine and strontium titanium, you measure this, it's from the X-ray diffraction point of view, it looks like a pure strontium titanate. You cannot really distinguish substrate and, and, and dentulum. That means your off-state chemistry is very, very small. But still, it's not perfect state chemistry. They're creating point defects. I think that's what our hypothesis is. And the surface is very smooth. And then you have and a very, very small one. But when you measure this Raman measurement, and you still see this kind of polar peak here. Okay? So up, to, up to room temperature, the 300 Kelvin, you see that this peak. So this peak actually drops as a function of temperature, but still room temperature, you have certain peak. And we also took the sample, and this is a chemical MD, I'll explain it later. Okay? This one is supposed to be perfect stoichiometric film. It's very close to one-to-one, -to -one, like a bulk single crystal, and it doesn't show polar peak in that, this kind of one. Okay? This is grown differently. It's not regular MBE. This one is called chemical MBE. I'm going to talk about that later. And it doesn't show this. So this one does not have these polar nano regions, but this one has a polar nano region. <coughs> Even though it looks like stoichiometric film, but you have a very miniature of a small amount of point defect. So we actually measure this by cross-sectional TDM and then we call stem. And then this stem allow you to do this kind of this bright one and dark one, and then you actually see the oxygen, and then this is a B site, or this is a B site, titanium, and then titanium, and you have measured actual shift of this titanium. And then you actually see this magnitude of polarization is actually significant. And all pointing down because screening of strontium leucine is a lot better than top is the, uh, the absorbate of, of the moisture or whatever things. So this is the indication of polar nano regions as I show on the schematic diagram. Remember that? So it's when your thickness approaches smaller, and this kind of polar nano regions is actually does exist, and then pointing down everything like this. Okay. So you measure the titanium, the off state of this uh, displacement here. This is uh, can be seen. This all the size of arrow and direction is displacement of of displacement with respect to oxygen. Okay. So this direct evidence of polar nano regions, what's the size, what direction of it, and then looks like the thin films, ultra thin films, has some kind of screening of it. So can you really measure ferroelectricity of this? So you measure, this one is this 120 unit cell thick film, it's a thick film. So that means your polar nano regions embedded but it's not really screened by the power of metabolic code. And then when you write this one, positive and negative, and then it, this one immediately disappear. It doesn't maintain it. Remember that? I show you thick films here decays so fast. Remember that? Decays. The time scale, you measure it, it's already gone. You don't see that. Okay? So when you have a change the thickness of the film, then certain point, you will be able to see that stable polarization by PFM. But 120 in cell is here, and that dies right away. Okay, that's what the data is showing here, this data. And you have something 60 in cell, and you have a certain maintain that time scale, but it's going away, that time scale. But 12 in cell, you see that? Very stable. Okay? You write the domain and they maintain forever. So that means our hypothesis is 
these nanopore regions reduce the dimension, and you can make a ferroelectric material at room temperature. Okay, so that's a one way you can measure by PFM, but you also can measure this one by other method. But this one is interesting. We have like a, most of materials, your ferroelectricity reduces the dimension and then disappear. That's what I show you first slide, the theory calculations and other measurement. <coughs> but in here, ferroelectricity, the non-ferroelectric material actually become ferroelectric at reduced dimension. That is, is breaking the conventional wisdom. Is when you go smaller, something disappears. But here, non-ferroelectric become ferroelectric only in reduced dimension. Okay? So he also measured by a P group. <coughs> P roof of a 24 unit cell, you clearly have remnant projection, 120 unit cell sigma looks dielectric. And then your pond measurement is also shows thin one, very clear, ferroelectric, and then 120 unit cell and nothing. Okay? So that is evidence of this ferroelectric emergence of ferroelectricity in non-ferroelectric strontium titanium material only reduced dimension and that is the coming from all these nanopolar regions and then you can actually use strontium titanate as a lot of interesting tunneling resistance measurement but the potentially and then this one can be used ferroelectric combining with the uh, lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate to the mandrel gas I haven't covered this one yet I'm going to talk about it tomorrow and then you can combine the ferroelectric and then the two-dimensional gas and strontium titanate. You can create a new functionality and then including 2D conductivity and dielectric functions, and even superconductive magnetism in the 2D vacuum gas. <coughs> and that offers a lot of uh, other possibilities. And then you can tune it by corrugation, non-volatile way. So you have strontium titanate can be non-volatile ferroelectric and that contains 2D electron gas and superconductivity and magnetism. So that's uh, something very exciting. And then, but this one is initially defect. Everybody want to get rid of defects. But you can use uh, this defect can create new functionality. So that means you have your sometime when you're looking for certain research, your direction, then you got some negative things, but it turns out to be very useful for some other reasons. Okay, so this one also has a quite good retention with time, and 12 unit cell retention is really good, as good as a ferroelectric barium titanate. And but very thick film, 120 unit cell dies so quickly, and then that's a, something is a two hours later, and then is a two just after writing, and then this two hours later, 12 unit cell it maintain is quite well. Okay, so now implication is inverse enhancement of ferroelectricity. Dimension is get reduced and ferroelectricity actually coming. So this is a new insight in nanomaterial science. When you get smaller, you can create neurons. And then simple and general role, new design role for ferroelectric and ultra thin films. And then this one is not limited to strontium titanate. Any dielectric material creating nanopolar regions, you can do the same thing. And I use the strontium titanate as an example, but this one that the eliminate calcium titanate, other one can be can be ferroelectric at reduced dimension. So that offers it's a nano electronics oxide nano electronics and the possibility and the beyond uh, this. So next one, I'm going to come back here, initial question I ask you. How to achieve perfect stoichiometry? <clears throat> we already have a lot of defects and an interesting ferroelectricity. But now, is these defects can be uh, deteriorous, uh, detrimental to uh, certain types of properties. So, in most complex acts, I said that strict control is uh, one of the most challenging issue and reduces their point defect concentration. And as I said, 
and B techniques, as I showed initially, conventional flux control, even read what the QCM, quartz crystal monitor, and at least 0.1 to 1%, and this deflect concentration, roughly 10 to 20 per cubic centimeter, is a lot. Okay? So that's the level of your defect concentration. Considering semiconductors, what is the doping concentration of your wafer? Silicon wafer coming as, uh, as received, 10 to the 15 per cubic centimeter the dopant. Okay, that's the base, base of the uh, doping concentration and P-type and type wafers. When you make uh, some device doping 10 to the 18 and 10 to the 20 that region, that's making active region. And this is a lot, 10 to 20. You need to make it better to make a really electronic device which is sensitive to the defects. So, so something, point defects, is always exist in any material system. And emergence exotic phenomena, as I show you, room temperature, ferro electricity, nanopolar regions. That's what we talked about first part. But point defects can be multiple uh, origin here stoichiometric control, and then energetic deposition, like a lot of energetic particles are hitting here, and then or some impurities. Okay? But I'm going to address this stoichiometric control to avoid anti-site disorder, which is anti de defect is the main defect. Okay? So this uh, reducing the defect, and then very important for quantum transfer, Especially when you quantum transport measurement, you need the extreme high mobility of material. And in order to do that, you have to reduce it, the quantum Hall effect, and then those things. Initially, like a fractional quantum Hall effect in a gallium arsenide. And they have very high mobility gallium arsenide. And then that's the reason they were able to do that. They shared the price. Horst Stormer, and Dan Sui, and then uh, 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 Bob Rothman. And they have uh, those initial. And the reason they were to do that with the gallium arsenide is the defect concentration so low and very high quality of materials. So I think one example here, what we learned during our process. When you grow this two-dimensional electron gas, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate boxing of crystal, and you get very nice two-dimensional electron gas behavior. But when you grow, PLD grown strontium titanate and then grow NaO. This is a homoaptaxial strontium titanate. You see, we expect the same material. Because yesterday I told you it's homoaptaxy and heroaptaxy. Do you remember that? So homoaptaxy means I grow same material on top of the same substrate. But strontium titanate grow strontium titanate and we expect this one is same as this. But when you do LAO on top, and supposed to have here to the electron gas, but for some reason, this one is insulating. That means this strontium titanate and this strontium titanate are not the same. Why is it not the same? And then when you measure X-ray and everything, it looks the same. But a very small amount of impurities or some defects and maybe the origin of it. And then that's a very important reason we have to work hard to get this stoichiometric film. So actually growing this stoichiometric film is putting this rock on top of this cusp. You try to go there and roll back this way and hard to put on top here. So, try to grow control of flux. You put in a little bit of B, then go here and roll back here. You try to go a little more A, roll back here, and never reach that the top here. It's extremely difficult in terms of flux control rows, or two flux. And then, when you do growth by single target, you have even same problem too. Okay? So, the way PLD grown thin film by controlling, controlling 
this actually change of laser energy density. Okay, that's the one of the parameters you can control. This the flux and then this the stoichiometry. And depending on laser influence, influence like low energy to high energy, 0.1 to a few joule per square, cent, a square centimeter. And you see that this lattice parameter is reach that stoichiometry like castle like this. That means very hard to get one point here, even though you make a measurement here, range of this. So that means almost impossible to do that perfect stoichiometry, this method. So you have to do something totally different way of thinking. And then this is the technique shown MB and then PLD sputtering, same kind of cusp shape. What is the approach to make avoid this cusp and then make a wide range of this and then solve the problem? And then you need this kind of mountain. You can make this kind of mountain. You can stoichiometric window is broad like this. Then you win. How can you do that? So in order to do that, what is actually make this kind of processing window? And then this window can be done by thermodynamic determined circuit and the let thermodynamics can can let figure it out. Not you figure it out. Thermodynamics, because it's actually thermodynamics is very important. And then solve this problem. What exactly mean is this known technique is is a galimarsenide process. Do you know the galimarsenide growth? Anybody know galimarsenide growth process? There's a gallium and arsenic growth is is what we call absorption control growth. The, at very high temperature, the arsenic is very volatile. Arsenic is vapor pressure is very high. Your, your sublimation temperature like oh, is is very low. So that means you're trying to deposit arsenic on arsenic surface. It doesn't stick. Okay? It does not stick on the top of the arsenic. But as long as you have a gallium on the surface and arsenic attached. So that means <clears throat> you have a gallium surface, one monolayer gallium. Then you deposit one monolayer arsenic. Even though you provide a lot more arsenic and doesn't grow anymore until you have a gallium attached to the surface. Okay, this is what we call absorption control process. It's known in gallium arsenide. Okay? So we have, can you use same thing in oxide? Can you do oxide system similar to this kind of absorption control glass process? It's already known that it works. If you have a very, very volatile species, and you can do that, which is Something we somebody asked question in the break is like a PDT growth. Lead is volatile. Okay, lead is volatile, and at very high temperature, lead doesn't stick. Lead just go away. But lead also providing a lot of flux of lead. If you have other element, the zirconium and titanium on the surface, it sticks, but not more than one layer. It just uh, dissolved. Then until next titanium or zirconium arrive, this is what we call absorption control. So this lead oxide, this is window, the P, uh, lead titanate grows depending on what kind of solid in the surface, and you have a different regions of phase diagram. The stoichiometric growth window is quite broad here, and this is what we call absorption control. Okay. So it's very important you understand thermodynamics and then your growth. This is a temperature and the gas process, uh, gas pressure. This is the gas pressure of the torque. So when you means is when you increase the lead flux, lead oxide flux, then you go higher and higher and higher, and they go higher. You have a window here. You have is in this region the lead doesn't lead oxide doesn't deposit. Lead oxide can be just a volatile. And for these regions, lead oxide is actually go away gas 
and only form the heat uh, lead titanate. And this region, you have extra lead oxide deposit. Okay. So you have a narrow window, but still the plateau can grow. No matter how much your flux you provide lead oxide, still you get only lead oxide, uh, uh, lead titanate. Do you understand that? Do you understand? So this region, you provide extra lead oxide, but that's only gas phase go away. And it does not form extra lead oxide formation. So this is what we call absorption control and due to high volatility of lead oxide. But strontium titanate does not have volatile species. Titanium and lead is not volatile. You cannot do that. So strontium titanate case, you have strontium and then you have this kind of phase diagram. And titanium is this kind of phase diagram. And then you have gross window for strontium titanate, maybe somewhere here, if you have certain species, can do like a absorption control. But we can you do this one? So what it did here is, is this is a too high temperature. Temperature is a 1400 degrees C. Okay? Can you do this one? It can be done similar way, but the temperature is too high. Really, you cannot achieve that way. And then this region, pressure is too low. You look at this one, strontium pressure, and this uh, temperature, and this window, the reasonable gross window that you do, your heater. What temperature heater you use? Your heater temperature, only 800 degrees C. Can you go your heater temperature up to 1400 degrees C? And you can do laser heating, but normally it's hard to do that. So reasonable strontium oxide pressure 10 to minus 9 torr, your, your, your background pressure 10 to minus 9 is MBE level, but reasonable temperature 800 degrees you don't do that, your vacuum level has to be better than 10 to minus 20 torr. 10 to minus 24 torr vacuum chamber, I don't think you can grow, you can make those vacuum chambers. Surface science growth chamber may be 10 to minus 12. But 10 to minus 24, you know, to get this kind of pressure of the strontium flux, your base pressure has to be even lower than this. 10 to minus 30, 10 to minus 40 torr, which is impossible to achieve. So that means you cannot do that using strontium oxide and relying on strontium oxide volatile species. Then you have to do something totally different approach. What is the approach then? Then you have to find volatile species is not elemental source, something different. This is organic source. And then this organic source has, they call, this one is actually developed by Santa Barbara group, the Susan Stammers group. And then they have used, they call TTIP, titanium isopropyl isopropyl oxide, and then they have a TTIP, and then you have a structure looks like this, but titanium is attached to oxygen and another organic around here. But this one is a liquid phase at room temperature, but when you heat it up around 100 degrees Celsius, then it becomes gas phase. The gas come out, and the gas actually has, is when you attach to here on the surface, and that is very volatile on the surface. So use this, this, uh, this one, TTIP, high vapor pressure, contains oxygen atom, and this one can be desorption limited feature around the 700 degrees Celsius, which means it's a gross temperature, rather than this kind of like a very unreasonable temperature, 1400 degrees Celsius, and then you can achieve desorption control limited growth around the little bit higher than 700 degrees. So this hybrid MBE at that position of strontium by strontium source, the metal source, the flux of TTIP is an organic source. Okay? This the TTIP is this one. And then this one has like absorption control like the gallium arsenide and lead oxide, very low temperature. <coughs> Then this is the first report of sodium control growth on strontium titanate. And what they show here, clearly, 
You have a strontium rich region and titanium region. You have plateau. Can you see the plateau here? And there's a lattice parameter measurement as a function of your TTIP flux. So which means you provide TTIP flux, titanium actual source, increase the higher and higher and higher, and then from 35 to 55. And you have, in this region, a strontium rich, but this region titanium rich because you get a lot of titanium. But you have no change in between those two. And those regions clear plateau, and then when you go low temperature, this plateau is narrower. Okay? So that means this plateau can be wider and wider and wider because you are easily to do absorption control. But you can get 800 degrees C quite reasonable window to do that. You can do 900 degrees C, 1000 degrees C even wider, but if this is uh, more than enough to achieve striking material wide window. And then more surprisingly important here, they actually measure the electron mobility at low temperature. And this film, lanthanum doped strontium titanate, your mobility of this over 30,000 at low temperature. This value is even higher than boxing of crystal. You dope it, lanthanum in boxing of crystal, the mobility is lower than thin films grown by this technique, which means your defect concentration or oxygen chemistry of this one is almost perfect. And then, and more importantly, you have a wide region of plateau. As I showed initially, the cost of to flat, that you can actually roll your rock on top of this, and that's exactly what this one showed. And then, so now, I think we know how to actually get this technique. And then you can use this chemical, chemical MD, and then providing is a chemical source as titanium. But it's not limited to strontium titanate. And then other groups are working on, and this one, strontium vanadate, or like a vanadium has a different types of precursor, and then they demonstrated exactly the same kind of absorption control and perfect speculative uh, strontium vanity. And then also, like a tell uh, the stannate, a uh, tin, a strontium, I uh, got barium stannate, barium tin oxide, it's also it's high mobility material, and also that can be demonstrated in absorption control. There's a lot of possibility as long as you know certain precursor of the element can be work in a range of certain temperature and then absorption uh, can be controlled in that region. So I'm going to stop it here and then I think that I started from questioning can you really achieve perfect stoichiometry? The answer here is yes, you can achieve it using this technique and then that allow you to achieve extremely high mobility of this and then otherwise and then this material can be very high defect concentration maybe very useful for other type of functionality as I demonstrated ferroelectricity and it is still major. Uh, so I want to start it here and then I will take some questions about this. So the second one. Yes. Can we create artificial PNR regions? Artificial PNR regions. So artificially, we can create in some other system to achieve uh, ferroelectricity at reduced dimension. As I show here, is some other dielectrics, so calcium titanate. We expect the calcium titanate can be those behave the same way. So uh, as as long as you have is a uh, the is um, the uh, the uh, the titanium is, is we have calculated like titanium is creating anti site in the strontium site, but something like a, for example if you have some ion damage or something may create similar polar energy. But I think that's artificial. You can add to some defects there, but uh, additional defects is we have to coming from other source of outside. 
maybe iron dam iron ions iron damage on the material maybe that's a possibility any other questions So then tomorrow um, we'll start. Okay. So that's uh, the today we learned uh, actual the thin film growth. We have two different uh, lectures about sputtering, and then second one is extreme control of stoichiometry, and then how this point defect plays a role. And uh, tomorrow I will talk about atomic layer control growth. But it's atomic layer control that really actually makes big difference in the interfaces. So when you make some interfaces, uh, you have to really precise control what the termination, what the is. So tomorrow we'll talk about not only technique, it's one example of 2D electroness and all that. Questions? Is it clear? Okay, so so we learned something here about the um, growth, and then if you have any questions about general other growth technique, I can bring that. But uh, I think those two are our main message here. I think. Uh, okay. Then uh, we can start the request. Uh, somebody is coming. Doing, doing so. First, first one is if that grow by epitaxy, then this is what we call solid phase epitaxy. It's not real epitaxy what you're doing. Which means solid phase epitaxy, you deposit material solid first and then rely on bulk diffusion. So you crystallize it at the interface and then propagate this one to the top. This is technique. Is high TC was first discovered, and everybody used that technique to grow high TC superconductors. The problem of this technique is we cannot make multi layers. Why is multi layer? You deposit multiple layers, you heat it at high temperature, you mess up on the interface because diffuse everything together. So, so people realize no, you cannot make a multi layer junctions or like tri layer structures. So that's why they came up this idea of in situ deposition, which is high temperature. You don't need a host annealing. You just deposit it at high temperature. But when you come to this high temperature deposition, zinc oxide at high temperature, very volatile. It doesn't stick very well, zinc oxide. So that means you have to do a lot of flux of zinc oxide, and then you deposit it at high vapor pressure of zinc oxide. And so people grow that way. And then, uh, but the solid state of taxi is, is, uh, is, is much harder to get the high quality of material because any obstetric element come to the surface and then a lot of junky layer on the surface. And also, your limited, actually very limited substrate can grow epitaxy of thin films. For example, our first high TC thin film was made is that people try to grow yttrium, yttrium metal carboxide on MGO, magnesium oxide, and, and then uh, yttrium stabilized zirconia. They use all kind of substrate. Everything turned out to be is insulator. And that's why they came up 
idea of using perovskite substrate, and then they used the perovskite substrate from the jewelry store. They couldn't find it at the time. They, there no commercially available substrate, and then they used that, and then immediately grow solid state tax even growing. But later, people made in situ that position. <coughs> And then they use a different substrate, like Eastern Siberian Zirconia, even MGO. You can get very nice taxi because uh, those things rely on surface diffusion. The surface diffusion is a lot more forgiving to grow epitaxy or thin films than many different substrates. So I, I think uh, some materials does not allow you to grow uh, the in situ epitaxy. And one example is pyrochrophase of iridate, like a, a lanthanum iridate, uh, iri, uh, presidium iridate, or samurian iridate, like 2 to 7 iridate, which is uh, very important, um, like uh, the, uh, the strongly correlated uh, and then uh, the uh, semi-metals, and then those systems, and then you have to use phase, solid phase, solid phase like that, see, not, you cannot go in situ. But maybe your material have a certain limitation, but I think it's a lot better to grow in situ. Yeah. yeah. We are growing those on IPOs actually. In Indian tin oxide. Like Indian tin oxide. Yeah. Indian tin oxide on top of graphene. Yes. Or in top of graphene. On the top of ITU, we are growing uh, graphene oxide with zinc oxide. Oh, okay. I see. I'm not an expert to graphene, but I think uh, you can. Uh, we can actually read the literature and then uh, we can find. Yes. Uh, to achieve this stoichiometry, uh, you could you speak up a little, okay. so Lyra? Uh, to achieve the stoichiometry of our material, mm -hmm. like we can give heat treatment, like thermal annealing. Mm -hmm. Oh, stoichiometric film by thermal heat annealing. Uh -huh. So why you believe the thermal annealing can make a stoichiometry? Any, any, any thought why? Thermal annealing can make a stoichiometric film. Do you think you thermodynamic, thermodynamically you look at the phase diagram, you heat it up, then you go to stoichiometric film? Maybe you're thinking about grow the film first with extra, extra like a strontium or titanium, and you heat it up, and you have to find the window, selectively certain element, it just to evaporate. And it doesn't have those window, then it doesn't change the stoichiometry. For example, strontium and titanium of stoichiometry self self regulating, and maybe for example, strontium is rich and the titanium poor. When you go higher temperature, and strontium titanium and strontium get go away, in order to do that, the strontium has to diffuse, bulk diffuse, long distance to the surface and just go away, and that's also very, very difficult to do. They only maybe lose some sort element from the surface. But you need diffusion profile. What the diffusion profile found I mean, follows the fixed law. So surface is efficient, maybe inside is a rich. So you cannot really have uniform composition. I think that's my thought. Yes? As long as your strontium titanate home epitaxy, you grow as thick as possible. You can grow maybe 100,000 and then you have no limitation. But uh, the, uh, the deposition of these uh, uh, materials also causes the uh, substrate to heat up, right? So substrate, heat up. yeah, heat up, right. So if you are supposed the window was initially at 800 degrees Celsius up to certain, uh, uh, certain width, okay. So now after heating up, so the uh, uh, window get wider. Yeah, wider. Yeah. So they, they try this windows up to maybe 900 <coughs> degrees C. I think that's what they report. 800, 900 degrees so wider. Mm -hmm. well, they don't have to go 1400 degrees C. If you go high temperature, like uh, I know the Japanese group, because uh, Tokura's group, it was in Japan, his group. 
and they are growing nine-winged obstruent in superconductors. And they used it uh, around 1100 degrees Celsius, very high temperature laser heating. So you want to go that high temperature, you can directly heat your substrate, not heat a block, and you heat that directly, the substrate by laser, and the infrared laser, and they heat that, and then they show that uh, the actual low temperature mobility is very, very high, and then that's out of the method. So today's lecture, we have a first one and second one. Do you have any feedback? I mean, the, which one you have more benefit for you guys? First one or second one? I like to ask the same question like yesterday. Um, which one is first? I like the first one more useful for me. More, more useful first one? Second one turns a subject specific. So first one was technical. So it was for everyone. And second one was for the people who are working for ferro electricity, etc. So first one was more beneficial and more informative. More interesting? Second one more interesting? First one. First one more interesting? Yeah, it was more technical. Like about more practical? Do you like the first one? Yeah. More than the second one? Okay, second, second one is uh, to Second one is uh, more uh, specialized, so the students who are working in the field of ferroelectrics, that will be more beneficial to them. Yeah. But the first one was beneficial to everybody. It was Everyone. It was She's saying that. Okay, good. Because yes, yesterday, I got the different feedback a little bit. You guys like the second one is more specific of the polar metals, and the first one is more general. So I got the maybe more second one preferred. Today is the opposite. <laughs> so I, I, I so I think fine. I, I need your your feedback. It's very important. And then that um, I'm trying to give my lectures for more beneficial for you guys. But the, the second one, the reason I brought this second one example. What is the important issue? But also, I like to share with you guys how we approach the science. And then not just the teaching techniques and knowledge here. I like to share how we identify important science questions and how we actually answer those things very elegant way we're trying to do. And then that's what I, I share and then uh, maybe not directly related to, I mean, maybe you have to take the, the take home message from my, my lecture. It's not directly related to, I'm, not, I'm doing this project for this. And then, okay, you are talking about specific example, nothing to do with my project. And maybe then if that is the case, you don't learn that much from my, my lecture. But uh, you can be more or less, okay, this is something material related to physics related question. And how you actually go answer those things? What is the important approach? How they solve the material growth issue or physics measurement issue? And then that's what I, I, I'm trying to share. So maybe if we prefer the first one type more, then I bring more like a first type of thing. When I bring yesterday, I mean, I mean, prepare these things. I, I, I prepare and tweaking yesterday after my first lecture. I expect the second one is more interesting for you guys, but surprisingly, you like the first one more than the second one. And then, um, so tomorrow, I think I'll, I'll talk about something more general, and then I bring one other one too. But uh, um, feel free to tell me. Every time I, I like to hear something more. Well, if you want to uh, tell me, okay, so tell me about the, your some other types of uh, challenges you have faced, how you overcome those things. Somebody asked questions, those things. Maybe those kinds are more useful. I bring those things too. So um, tell me what you want, and then uh, from this, so maybe this lecture can be evolved from day by day. Maybe the last lecture I can change it very differently from the first or second one. But I, I think you, you tell me why I have some input. Because I, um, this is a different audience than most of the audience I give a talk. And then, uh, and then uh, when I go in conference, like a one lecture like this. And then those lectures is a one hour lecture. And then uh, that's it. But here is a series of lectures. Like all many, and then this many of them, and you can be very bored. 
listening many of those, right? So I think I'm trying to make uh, this every lecture interesting for you guys at the same time, and then we learn something from this. So, bulk SEO is white in color. SRT are You, you have to use the color. So uh, we get a colorful uh, fringes of SRTIO3 on the surface. Uh, colorful fringes. Yeah. That's the that thickness fringes, the interference, yeah, interference fringes. That because uh, your film is not uniform thickness. The same thing when you drop oil on water and you see the rainbow color, okay? And same thing, your film is, because of this dielectric is transparent material and your light goes through yeah, you bring the reflect like, uh, the interference of this in the center region. You don't see that, but maybe you around the edge region you see that kind of pattern. That's a thickness. So immediately you see that your film has a non-uniformity of thickness edge region. But that's okay. I mean, you can imagine the center, and then all the thin films that you grow should have those kind of things, especially the PLD thin films, ten by ten cent. And you, you should see that. But spot train, you grow large area, you don't see that. That's why I advertise it. I encourage you to do spot train. 10 by 10, just flat. You, not, you, you don't see that. Go within that range. Sir, uh, so in this absorption, you control both uh, synthesis layer by layer both. So can we expect that the beams deposited will be always be uniform? You mean the thickness Thickness uniformity is only depending on is how the flux is uniform. For example, strontium flux coming from nucent cell. Okay? Strontium is, you know what the nucent cell, K cell? So the evaporation can be done like a very long, like crucible surrounding the heater. The strontium is coming as a, like a sublimation. The strontium coming like looks like this. Okay? And then this distance further, it's just for the, for the distance, you get more uniform. And the shorter distance is uniformly poor. But TTIP is gas phase, gas injection. And dependent on gas injection is an injector. Injector is more focused, injector is more spread. So this is the design of your system. So if you want to hear more about technical things, how to do your lab and things like that, and then we can, we can talk about this. But uh, I can mix something. But um, yeah, I, I like to your your feedback. It's very important your feedback. So, uh, like if I'm uh, generating thin films via PLD and RF spatter coating, right? And I have to use these thin films for immobilization of certain biomolecules, right? And for that, I have to give treatment of certain buffers and washing, and so many washing steps and all. So PLD is more stable compared to RF sputter. Right? Is there any simple method to increase the stability of this RF uh, sputter coating thin film? So why the RF sputtering is unstable? Because your film RF sputtery film is off stoichiometric. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe. Because uh, your growth of some thin films is your is we happen to see this one. For example, you get a strontium titanate grow very strontium rich and strontium rich and form the strontium oxide strontium oxide in air forming easily strontium carbonate and strontium carbonate convert uh, initially strontium hydroxide so that can be easily <coughs> etched by the water and uh, maybe your your composition is not perfect stoichiometry and then maybe POD1 is better so maybe you can try off sputtering, see how it goes. So I just tried with gold sputtering. I was uh, preparing thin films of gold only by RF Gold? Gold. Okay, gold is uh, just single element, so it doesn't, but the, all the metals, when you deposit metals, sputtering works much better than PLD. Because PLD metals are very difficult, you need much higher energy to do that. Five, four, five, six joules per square centimeter is a lot higher energy. And then, then, then the this uh, the oxide materials. But the upper layer was, you know, leaching out every time when I washed it. So, is there any solution to that, or maybe I have to talk to you about the, the product more? Face, I mean, the individual. I have to learn more about this because uh, 
I just learned what, what you said. And then, uh, yeah. Sir. Yes. The epitaxis in film produced by MBE technique, uh, that is of much more quality compared to if, if we can produce the same quality by RS sputtering also. It depends on uh, what kind of quality, what kind of um, like requirement you need. For example, some of the uh, the material is successful to grow uh, by uh, the MBE technique is what we call RP phase. RP phase is is adding extra like uh, layers in between. So what they mean is you actually make layers individual control of like individual sub layer. So you know that as I said, when you grow RX sputtering, like sputtering and PLD, you have a composite target. You mix everything. Okay, what they mean is your growth the building block is not the sub unit cell. The building block is a unit cell by unit cell. You have one oscillation, the single oscillation is correspond to one unit cell, which means strontium oxide, titanium oxide, those two layers coming at the same time. Okay, unit cell by unit cell. But this MBE technique, you have an individual elemental control. You have a half unit cell in control. So that means strontium oxide and titanium oxide, you can do individual layer. And then recently, some group at Temple University and then uh, Shaoxing Shi School, he demonstrated using PLD, using strontium oxide target, TiO2 target. These are two targets. Rather than composite target, they demonstrated similar to MBE. So in terms of this, this uh, growing of this, I think you can do very similar to MBE can do. And then it's, it's a real stoichiometry and then precise control is another issue. Because uh, when you do PLD, what we actually faced in PLD problem. <clears throat> I don't know what mode you do PLD. Is that your energy constant mode or your voltage constant mode? You have two different modes of operation. You have a constant voltage mode, then energy drift with time. Okay? Your laser energy drift with time, which means your growth rate changes over time. So that means you have to correct, you have to correct the number of pulses. So you have, you require one half mono layer, like a TiO2 layer, you need a 50, 50, 50 pulses of the uh, laser. 50 pulses of the laser required the one half, one half, uh, half mono layer. But initially you need a 50, and later you need a 53, because energy drift. So those kind of correction can be done watching the read, uh, read pattern. Okay, your read pattern, you go maximum top, and we go too high, then your, your actual lead pattern looks, looks different. So the oscillation looking at, and then that's the one way they can control. But you need uh, some kind of feedback system to do that. But I think you need some creativity, but it's no like a limitation of doing it. But the, right now, I think we are doing something new, synthesis technique to, to adapt, adapt to this kind of uh, absorption control in other, other systems. But I think you have you can have POD or spotting can be as effective as, as other. But you have a much more um, uh, like a, a easily controllable and then uh, um, maybe less uh, effort to set up and then maintain it. Any other things you want to bring, uh, other lectures? I want to hear more about this. I want to hear more about this. And then uh, I'd like to hear something. I want to hear more subjects about this. Because uh, we set up the schedule like this. And then this like, schedule doesn't need to be, we have, don't have to follow exact the schedule. We, have, we are very flexible. So can you please add lectures <coughs> for these uh, spin coatings in film process? <coughs> spin coating? Yes. Okay, so that's not my expertise, but I can uh, bring something because uh, um, my, uh, my friend actually using spin coating uh, technique 
how uh, he's in Solomon's group, and then I can bring few uh, slides, sure. and then uh, they can be useful. And then uh, yeah, anybody wants to hear certain things, and then I, I do the homework, and then I can bring it to you. Which is a uh, which is a purpose. I mean, I think I have a certain resources. I know some some work done. I'm not the uh, expert of this, but I can provide some help at those resources and uh, where you can find. Other things that you are into here more? Yes. So uh, you will uh, lecture on that two-dimensional electron gas also, no? Yes, I'll do. Because we, I mean, my junior was uh, struggling with this two-deck property for strontium copper oxide at SRTI O3. So we were not getting that two deck property by PLD. By PLD. Yes. So not not lanthanum alumate strontium titanate. That uh, already one person has tried. So some other system SRCU two O two. S SRCU two O three. O two. O two. Uh, so that was predicted theoretically that it will show two deck. Okay. Any group made uh, two electron gas from that system? Uh, Anybody made that? Two electron gas from that particular system or not? Ha ha, that uh, on LAO STO, yeah. uh, two day properties were there. Yes, that's right. But the, the one you just said, the mm. strontium copper, copper. copper, anybody made those mm, things? No. Okay, so, so sometimes um, the theory papers, huh. I mean, people read the theory papers and then <laughs> and try this. Hmm. But theory paper doesn't necessarily to everything is correct. Hmm. And then uh, so, when you do that, I think some calculation is uh, um, some approximation or some missing something. So if it doesn't come out, theory calculation is is uh, then then doesn't need to be okay. You don't have to, I mean, hundred percent believe what 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 the theory said. And for example, what we did uh, is uh, uh, the previous work, like Paul Amaros, for example, and then. Uh, the theory initially said, no, it, it doesn't show the polar mirror. But experimentally, we confirmed this later, we go back and ask the calculator again, and then they found that, yeah, yeah this is the one. So, so I think it's, it's, it's don't hundred percent, I mean, that's why I, I like to be an experimentalist. <laughs> experimentalist, experimentally shows it's a good experiment. The data go forever, and that's accurate. And then that's a really, you can prove it something. But it has to be the good experiment. Good material, that's why I focus you guys. Even 10 years down the road, still your data is valid. It's really good data. You want to produce that. Because uh, there's a lot of work is, is a, a quality of, I mean, your, your experimental work getting better and better. For example, now you cannot see certain things, but Maybe 10 years later, your new measurement technique can see something. And then, but material, also, quality material improves over time. But at this stage of, like right now, can you make your material the best quality so that you can probe and then your fundamental properties as accurate as possible? Okay, so about the seven minutes. So, any burning questions? And then I want to uh, give us some feedback, and then uh, I happy to answer any subject. I mean, uh, you want to hear more? <coughs> okay. So, certain project, the certain ones maybe you know, less interesting. Certain one is more interesting, but. Um, I think it's, I, I like to change my uh, in the course outline if you want to hear something more more exciting, more beneficial. Okay, all right, thank you.